Occasionally I send out random tweets. I did one yesterday and it's been retweeted and liked more than anything else I've ever done. It was simply this. I was on a platform at King's Cross and a man came walking towards me on the platform and he was holding a sign that simply said on it, Jesus. And as I said in my tweet, unfortunately my train came too quickly for me to be able to ask whether he was a religious believer or a social commentator. I think people like that tweet and that story because it does speak to about where we are right now in the middle of a Brexit situation which only seems to get worse and more intractable and where nobody seems to know what's going to happen. But in that context, there is an idea that is starting to grow a bit of momentum. It's got support from politicians like Lisa Nandy and Stella Creasy, the Labour MPs. It's got support from some quite... Uh, Famous people like Damon Alburn and the Archbishop of Canterbury and Ian McEwan and Dan Snow. And it's got support from the RSA. And that is the idea of a citizens' assembly, bringing together a group of representative citizens to talk about where we are on Brexit and to see whether through that conversation we can start to get new insights and we can start to see whether there is any kind of option that the public might be willing to support. Now, if you'd asked me just a week ago, I'd have said this is far-fetched, but it feels like it's moving up the agenda, if only because nobody else knows what else to do. So we had recorded some interviews for Polarised with people who are experts on deliberative democracy. Citizens' Assemblies is an example of deliberative democracy. And what we've done is we decided to bring forward that programme, get it out today in the middle of this Brexit crisis, because we think it could be a way forward. The eyes to the right, 202. The nose to the left, 432. It is clear that the House does not support this deal, but tonight's vote tells us nothing about what it does support. This government cannot govern. So you don't have a plan. Hang on, you said you had got a plan B. You haven't got a plan B. Delaying to have a second referendum is not an option. What's the point of plan? Whatever your point of view, it's all too easy to look at the state of democracy today and conclude that something has gone seriously wrong. In the UK, the direct democracy of the Brexit referendum has thrown politics into complete disarray. And around the world, representative democracies are becoming ever more febrile. But what if there was another form of democracy that could help sort out some of this mess, something that could help us navigate the big and complex policy challenges we now face, something that could actually renew the public's faith in the system? This week, I'm going to try to convince you that exactly such a thing exists, that other countries are already doing it, and that 2019 is the year we should put it into action in the UK. Welcome back to Polarised, the RSA podcast that's all about the big divides in our culture and our politics and how to fix them. I'm Matthew Taylor, and this week I'm setting out the case for deliberative democracy. You're used to hearing me chatting with Ian Leslie, but he's away this week. So uh, I'm bringing you a couple of conversations I've been having that explore this idea of deliberation. It's something I've talked about before on the podcast, but today is a chance to really explore it properly. And my hope is that by the end, you'll want to know more about it. So in a moment, we're going to listen to a conversation I had with James Fishkin. He's really the godfather of deliberative democracy. And with my friend David Runciman, who you'll probably know because he's one of the UK's leading thinkers on democratic breakdown. Now, before I get into the conversation with James and with David, I I just want to lay out what the key elements of deliberative democracy are. Councillor, you wish to make an open statement? I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want... I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our jury system. That's no ideal to me. That is a living, working reality. You want answers! I want the truth! So first of all, when I talk about deliberation, I mean things like citizens, juries or assemblies. 
And, and the principle at the heart of them is a bit like the one you'd have come across if you've ever done a criminal jury, but you'd have watched juries on TV. Basically, you bring together a group of people, and when it comes to deliberation, it's usually between about you know 20 or maybe up to 100. And they're chosen because they're independent, but they represent a cross-section of the population, not just in terms of their kind of age and ethnicity and gender and class, but also in terms of the opinions uh, that they start from. So these people are then brought together and they spend typically three or four days over a couple of weekends and they read evidence that's been prepared from all sides of the topic. They speak to people who represent a whole range of views and they get a chance to question them. And then they work together in groups uh, to explore what they've heard, to develop other questions that they might ask and to start to debate the questions. And then at the end of that process the group is invited to come up with recommendations. Now, on the one hand, this might be about them reaching a consensus. But also, what you can see in the process is the journey that people go on, the way in which listening to evidence and talking to each other can actually change their opinions. That's one of the the really attractive things about deliberation, that it does actually involve people going on a journey and changing their mind. The kind of issues that you can talk about in these processes range from abortion reform to public spending to energy policy. Now, I'm a great fan of deliberation, but it's important to understand it's not an alternative to representative democracy, but it is something that can powerfully enhance it because it can show how citizens can change their views and it can give politicians who often feel kind of under siege a rationale for doing brave things, for sorting issues out. And my goodness, we could do with politicians with a bit more bravery right now. So that's the kind of bare bones of deliberation. It's a pretty simple idea. But if I had to boil it down to one key principle, it is that principle of the jury. And that is, although only a small number of people get involved in deliberation, all of us watching it and listening to it have the confidence that had we been through the same process, we'd have been likely to reach the same conclusions ourselves. Now, I am confident that you gentlemen will review without passion the evidence that you have heard, come to a decision, do your duty. So to talk about deliberation, and in particular to hear some stories about how it's been used all around the world, who better to talk to than James Fishkin? He's Professor of Communication and Political Science at Stanford University, and many people would say he's the godfather of deliberation. My goodness, godfather? That can mean a lot of different things after (laughs) Hollywood's treatment of that. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I don't see you as a threatening figure. Um, (laughs) So this interview is for a program called Polarised. We think that there is quite a lot of evidence for polarisation, perhaps not as bad in Britain as in, Amer- as in America. As someone who's been observing the political scene for many decades, do you buy into the idea that polarisation has become worse in recent times? Oh, yes. I, I'm uh, convinced of it. Uh, in the US, uh, the survey evidence is that the public has become somewhat more polarised and the political elites have become much more polarised. And I think the, th- the same is true in Britain. Certainly Brexit has dramatically polarised both the public and the uh, political elites. And we're sitting here, no one's got the faintest idea what's going to, what's going to happen. So do you think that the fact that we have a more polarised political system makes the case for deliberation even stronger? Well, yes, because part of our problem is a referendum is a very crude way to consult the public. Now, of course, for very consequential decisions, a referendum has the merit that uh, everybody's vote counts. So it lives up to political equality. The question is, how informed are the voters? What effective motivation is there for them to consider the competing sides? And it often oversimplifies the problem into a question that is usually yes and no. So... I uh, think that uh, referendum institutions and other, indeed, electoral campaigns should be supplemented with methods of deliberative democracy. So the the fact that a referendum is a binary choice, but also the fact that getting, turning people out is an important thing, so you want to motivate them. So 
in the course of a referendum, it is actually polar. It, it, it may reflect polarization because it's government having a referendum to get them out of the fact that people are divided. But actually, the very process of the referendum, of campaigning for it, is likely to polarize people further. Well, yes, it can do so. Parties and campaigns don't really want to win the argument; they want to win the election. And the question is, how can you incentivize them to also want to win the argument on the merits? And I think uh, by making deliberative institutions consequential, you can change the the incentives. Now, I'm and I'm a great deliberation fan, but there may be people listening to this podcast who don't understand the detail and haven't. I mean, this is shocking. Haven't even read your book. So, could you <laughs> could you share the core principles of deliberation with us? Well, look, the core principles of deliberative democracy are political equality and deliberation. Now, there are different ways of getting political equality. You could have everybody vote, or you could have a random sample vote, which gives every individual an equal chance of being in the random sample, and then in the random sample, every vote counts equally. So that's how you can get to a microcosm. Now, with a microcosm of several hundred... Sometimes people use the phrase mini-public. A mini-public, a microcosm, uh, whatever. So we have done deliberative polls, I call them, that put all of Britain in one room, or all of the United Kingdom in one room, or all of the United States in one room, or even all of the European Union in one room, where they can really think and weigh the opposing arguments. The root of the word deliberation is weighing, weighing the competing reasons on the basis of good information. So I just ask the simple hypothetical, what would the people think under good conditions for thinking about it. So uh, you get the people through random sampling, you get the good conditions by carefully preparing and vetting with representatives and stakeholders from the opposing points of view, materials that are evidence-based and accurate and where uh, something is in controversy, you get the competing statements of the controversy. But the best basis for discussion. And then if you bring a sample together to deliberate, they do that in moderated small groups, then in plenary sessions where their questions are brought to competing experts who answer from different points of view. You do that for, let's say, a whole weekend. And then they take a confidential survey. They don't come to a public consensus because there's social pressure for that. Do you want to know what they really think in secret ballots? You have secret ballots or questionnaires on first contact to prove that they're representative because you can compare the people who come with the people who don't come. And then at the end of this deliberative process. And uh, about two thirds of the time, those opinions change significantly from the beginning to the end. And then you try to make those views consequential in some decision process or with the media or whatever. So that's what I call deliberative polling. So let's take a couple of concrete examples of this, because I think people listening might think, well, that sounds like an interesting experiment that you might undertake in an American university. But you've been doing this in real world situations on real world issues and making a difference for many years. So I want to pick a couple of those examples. Can we start with Texas and energy policy? Because that, when you talk about Texas and energy policy, you think, well, that sounds quite intractable. That had a big effect. The um, Public Utility Commission in Texas had the option from the legislature of requiring that the big utility companies consult the public. The question was, do they provide more electricity through um, coal, through natural gas, through renewable energy such as wind power? Do they pipe the electricity in from Mexico? The company said... If we do polls, these are complicated issues the public won't understand or won't know what to recommend. If we do focus groups, you can never show that they're representative because they're too small. If we have open meetings, we'll just be flooded by lobbyists. Uh, So they contacted me, and we organized deliberative polls with the request for me, a requirement for me, that they have all the stakeholders involved who had an interest in the issue, the environmental groups, the consumer groups, the environmental groups who were advocating alternative energy, the advocates of different kinds of energy, the big customers, all of them, sitting around a table vetting the briefing materials in an advisory group, and then we prepared the questionnaire. And then we got good samples of each territory. And then something very interesting happened. Averaged over the eight projects, 
the percentage of the public that was willing to pay more on their monthly bills in order to um, support renewable energy, basically wind power, went, uh, went from 50% to 85%. And that was startling. They were, and some of these involved quite poor areas. They were willing to actually pay more on their monthly bill. Didn't have to be a lot more, but somewhat more their monthly bill to, to invest in wind power. And that actually influenced policy, Jim? Yes, because these, these had to be filed with the commission, and so the companies had to put that in their plans. The public really wrestled with the choices, and they were willing to invest in wind power. And the, the cumulative result is that Texas went from being number 50 among the 50 states in wind power in 1996 to being number one, surpassing California, A journalist from The Economist uh, wrote this up at one point and sent me a picture and said, those are your windmills. (laughs) (laughs) So can we go from Texas to a completely different environment, Uh, Mongolia? Tell us what you did in Mongolia. Mongolia is a competitive democracy since 1992. And the uh, mayor of Ulaanbaatar, who's a great democratic figure in the country, came to see me. He said, we have a country where we have highly polarized parties, accusations of political corruption. The government swings back and forth in elections from one party to the other. There's a tabloid news media, uh, and uh, social media spreads uh, disinformation. Have you ever heard of a democracy like that? (laughs) So I said, yes. And he said, what would you do about it? Well, I think deliberative democracy could help. I went to Mongolia with support of the Asia Foundation, and uh, we helped them organize a deliberative poll for the city of Ulaanbaatar, which is half the population of the country. It was on what infrastructure projects to build in their long-term planning. And this was such a success, the national government passed a law requiring deliberative polling. The law requires two things. It requires that before the parliament can consider a constitutional amendment, it has to commission a national deliberative poll. And then secondly, that local officials should um, use deliberative polling at the local level to distribute community development funds. So we helped them conduct a national deliberative poll. And I showed at the RSA a picture of the nearly 700 people who were almost a perfect sample of the country. Sitting in front of a it's statue sit- of Genghis Khan. Sitting in front of a statue of Genghis Khan on the steps of the government palace, which is the parliament and the other main institutions of government. And they deliberated about having uh, fighting corruption, having an independent civil service, having an independent judiciary. All those were at 90% by the end. And those have been fashioned into an amendment, which is being considered by the parliament now. And I think it has, I'm told it has a great deal of support. So we will see soon whether it passes. That uh, story that you told, by the way, has forged in my mind forever now, a link between Genghis Khan and and deliberative democracy. And and actually, it also helped us because that very day you came and spoke to us, we have been developing our own campaign for deliberative democracy and a legal requirement to deliberate is one of the things that we're thinking about. Um, Brexit, we're sitting here in the middle of the chaos. We've no idea what's going to happen. If someone was to ask you now to use deliberation to help us with the position that we're in, do you think you, you could do that? And what would you do? Well, obviously, I would do and I would help credible people organize a national deliberative poll, a random sample of the United Kingdom, to deliberate about whatever the issues are on offer at the time. And would that be to to recommend what to do about our relationship with the European Union, or could it be used to recommend how we structure a second referendum, for example? It could be used for any of those things. When I started deliberative polling, which I started with Channel 4 in 1994 in the United Kingdom... Yeah. Uh, we helped uh, you invent it, and, and yeah. then it's exported around the world. <laughs> right, right. Well, yes, it was. Uh, we were making television programs. But uh, increasingly, I'm interested in consequential decisions and the context, the entry points for the deliberation of the people where uh, the results can have uh, consequences. And I think that um, it would be very, there are thousands of, literally thousands of polls about Brexit all the time, but there are no deliberative polls. A deliberative poll would 
be uh, large enough in scale to be scientifically representative, but you could also understand the reasons for whatever opinion changes mm-hmm. there were. And so, yes. And that's very important because one, one of the things that's made the Brexit debate so polarizing is the way in which people caricature each other's motives. Right. But through a deliberative process, those people who change their mind, you'd be able to ask them, well, why did you change your mind? Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we, we do that. And also, in face-to-face discussion in moderated small groups, people who differ very uh, powerfully nevertheless come to understand people on the other side. We did a deliberative poll in Northern Ireland, which was broadcast by the BBC, which um, really showed that Protestants and Catholics could come to some mutual understanding of uh, what to do on a complex issue. This was about schooling, but also the mutual respect that each had for each community had for the other went up about 16 points. Uh, so this brings me, Jim, perfectly to the, to the last question I wanted to ask, which is that, I mean, politics is ugly. That, that's one of the reasons we see polarization. We have television programs here, question time, any questions. We have parliamentary questions. We have all sorts of programs, people shouting at each other, people caricaturing each other. The, the media are setting the whole thing up in order to have a kind of big row. Right. One of the things about deliberation is that it isn't ugly. It's, it's rather moving, isn't it, when ordinary people get together and they right. listen to each other. The aesthetics of deliberation mm-hmm. are rather wonderful. Yes, We can bring polarized communities together. And one of the things I learned in the Northern Ireland project was that random samples of the people had views that were rather similar to the organized groups that speak for them, but they weren't so entrenched and intense as the um, official advocates. And so there was more room for them to listen to each other and understand the viewpoints of each other. And there's a kind of empathy that comes about if you're discussing something for a day or a weekend with other people in a small group. You begin to look at the world from their side and you begin to have some idea what's motivating those statements that at the beginning you might have found um, very difficult to understand. That, that's a soothing balm that we need to put over some of these wounds that we're inflicting on ourselves. And I say that as an American where we have the same problem, as you pointed out, as here. And I think that deliberative democracy can speak for the people. And what is democracy ultimately supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about some connection between the, quote, will of the people and what's actually done. But we need to nurture the conditions for the will of the people to grow in a positive way where it's based on mutual understanding and it's based on evidence and it's based on the consideration of reasons, not just, uh, not just passions. So there we are. The idea of politics is a soothing balm. How, how different that feels from the way things are right now. Um, Jim, thank you for speaking to Polarize. But most of all, thank you for the brilliant work you do around deliberative democracy. Thank you so much. That was James Fishkin. To hear more, you can watch his RSA talk on revitalising our politics through public deliberation, and that's on the RSA's YouTube channel. Now, not everyone is as convinced as James and myself about deliberation, and it does have its challenges. David Runciman is an academic at Cambridge University. He's one of our leading political thinkers. His recent book, How Democracy Ends, was one of the major contributions last year on the theme of democratic decay and reform. And you've probably heard his voice because he explores all sorts of political issues every week on his brilliant podcast, Talking Politics. It's my favourite, apart from this one, of course. So, David, I've hijacked the end of a conversation I've had with you for your brilliant podcast, for the RSA's podcast, which is uh, called Polar. I've been talking to David for some time, and I've been trying to persuade him that deliberation might be one important part of fixing our democracies. And I think I might, I just might be making some progress. Is it part of what justifies deliberative democracy, that it's more likely to come up with the right answer? Because this is, again, a kind of timeless question about democratic politics. Is what legitimates it the fact that ordinary citizens have arrived at an answer, whether it's a good one or a bad one? Or is what legitimates it that if you involve as many people as possible and get a wide range of points of view, you're more likely to come up with, in some sense, the correct answer? I think it's both. I think that if people spend time and they look at something and they understand it in depth, they are more likely to reach the right conclusion 
about it. Also, I think one of the critical things about deliberation is it legitimizes the representatives making braver choices. Very few advocates of deliberation at this stage are arguing that it should replace representative democracy. It is always used to inform the choices made by representatives and very often to give them, in a sense, greater legitimacy to make difficult decisions for the long term. Now, there are dangers in badly designed deliberation. One danger is a kind of soggy compromise. And so it's very important that you don't say to people through deliberation, you have to reach an agreement you all sign up to. What you need to do is reflect the view of the group, and there may still be differences at the end. But the interesting thing is the balance of opinion and the journey that people uh, have been on. Actually, there's another danger that uh, Cass Sunstein and others have talked about, which is that when you get people to deliberate, the danger is that the extremes are the most powerful poles and that people are driven apart. It turns out that you can mitigate that as well if you design it correctly. There might well be a suspicion that deliberative democracy is kind of trying to get progressive politics in by another route. I think there is, there is a challenge here, not least this is about slow, informed politics. These are good things. But so much of what drives contemporary politics is large crowds, charismatic leaders, effective slogans, sloganeering. Is there a danger that deliberation looks like it is deliberately trying to counter that? There are certain patterns that emerge from deliberative processes. Yes, it it does tend to lead citizens to think a bit more about the long term and the consequences of decisions and the relationship between decisions, which, of course, is a massive problem for referenda because it doesn't enable you to see those connections. And, you know, there are certain patterns. If you have a deliberative process around criminal justice, people do kind of tend to start as Daily Mail readers and the old Daily Mail and end up being more like The Guardian. But there's another side to this, which is possibly more comforting for people from a kind of right of centre perspective, which is another characteristic, is that citizens often go into these processes saying it's all the government's fault and are more likely to come out saying, actually, no, it's to do with us and it's to do with how we behave and what we have to do. But ultimately, you know, you can't predict the outcome of these processes. So I guess if you think it's inherently progressive to consider an issue properly and to consider all sides of it and to deliberate, yes, it is, you know, it's a, it's a progressive conspiracy, but... I think that's just an argument we kind of have to have. I, you know, I, I want to meet someone and talk to them who says, look, politics isn't real if it's not shallow and polarised and adversarial. So listening to the, the, the talk you did recently, which led to you making the radical suggestion of votes for six-year-olds. Which is all anyone remembers. Well, about. you must have known what you put it. I'm naive economic. I don't know what people are going to pick up on. And not for the first time, David, because it was the same in your book. I'm waiting for this moment when you go, and of course, deliberative democracy, all this wonderful stuff around the world, we need to do more of that. So A, is deliberation part of the answer? And B, slightly more personally, what's your problem with it? So I have to say, you are increasingly persuading me that it is. Um, I think I've gone on a little journey in the last year. Um, I was at an event recently talking about uh, new kinds of participation, and I found myself channeling you and making the point that we've got to get away from thinking that participation is the answer to our democratic discontents. And also, a lot of people in that room, and that was a pretty educated room, um, confusing participation and deliberation and thinking that they're somehow the same thing and they're not. So I know you had that thought about my book, and that, in that case, it didn't occur to me it was part of the solution. I'm, I'm halfway there. Um, and I, do, I actually do think, particularly when you look at how difficult it is to map the partisanship and the division that we have now onto parliamentary electoral politics, and it must be the case that more participation would entrench the problem. Deliberation is almost the only thing left on the table. So even people like me who've kind of grown up with some slight suspicion of it as a slightly wonkish and um, a little bit of a kind of book-based solution to democracy are coming around to the idea that um, you're probably right. Because I should end there. That, that's you where should. I should end. But, but I think the point I make is what politicians have actually done is to, to use direct democracy as a way of trying to save representative democracy. And that was the wrong... They, they bet on red and they should have been betting on black. And black is deliberation because deliberation is not an alternative, but it could be a way to overcome the problems of representation. Yeah, and, and I think they were doing it partly because there was a big drive for that in this divided society. But I think we've got enough evidence now that it doesn't end well. Mm. This is a good moment to think of something else. David Runciman. To hear more from David, you can watch his RSA talk on his book, How Democracy Ends, on the RSA's YouTube channel, or just subscribe to his podcast, 
Talking Politics. The interviews with James and David, well, I did them a few weeks ago. What's interesting to me is even in the time since I spoke to them, the momentum behind deliberation seems to have built up. A lot of people, for example, have been talking about it as a way of responding to the Brexit crisis. So uh, my hope that 2019 is a big year for deliberation, well, it, it started that way. If I've persuaded you that deliberation should have an important role in the way we do democracy, I'd like you to think about joining the RSA's campaign. There's a link in the notes for this episode to our website where you can sign up. It would be great to have more people joining up. Thanks for listening to this episode of Polarised. I'm Matthew Taylor. The producer was James Shield. And Polarised was brought to you by the RSA. 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 RSA.